Hi, good day everyone! This video lecture is another story of love and adventure that focuses on the two main characters. They are described as a sculptor and a statue which namely Pygmalion and Galatia. Pygmalion derives its name from the famous story in Ovid's Metamorphosis in which Pygmalion is a man of issues when it comes to dating women. He met rude, some are selfish, which revolted him to the faults of women and left him feeling depressed. That's why he viewed women as flawed creatures and vowed to never spend any moment with them. And that's when he carved a beautiful statue with wondrous art. It is more perfect than any living woman. And the more he looks at her, the more he loves her until he wants her to be more than a statue. And he named it Galatia. So that's a quick introduction of the story. Before we go to a deeper discussion, let's have our objectives. And that is at the end of the lesson, 100% of the students with 85% level of proficiency should be able to first able to interpret the underlying moral lesson of the story, second, recognize the different characters, and third, appreciate the new word and knowledge that can lift from the story. So now let's have watched this video summary of the story. In ancient Greece, on the island of Cyprus, there lived a handsome and talented sculptor named Pygmalion. He loved his work and would spend hours carving beautiful ivory statues. He was always at his happiest when immersed in his art. Pygmalion had many problems when dating women. He always seemed to date the wrong women. Some were rude. Others were selfish. He was revolted by the faults in these women. It left him feeling very depressed. Pygmalion saw women as flawed creatures and vowed never to waste any moment of his life with them. He dedicated himself to his work and soon created Galatea, a beautiful statue of a woman out of ivory. Pygmalion worked so long and with such inspiration on the statue of Galatea that it became more beautiful than any woman that had ever lived or been carved. When his chisel finally stopped ringing, there stood before him a woman of such perfection that Pygmalion, who had professed his disdain of all females, fell deeply in love. Treating Galatea as if she were his girlfriend, he brought his ivory statue shells and pebbles, little birds and flowers of all colors, anything that he thought would please his love. He was obsessed. The festival of Aphrodite was at hand, a festival celebrated with great pomp at Cyprus. Sacrifices were offered, the altar smoked, and the odor of incense filled the air. When Pygmalion performed his part in the prayers, he silently prayed for a wife like his ivory statue. He stood before the altar of Aphrodite and whispered, You gods, you can do all things. Give me, I pray you, for my wife. Goddess Aphrodite understood what the poor man was trying to say. She was curious. How can a man love a lifeless thing so much? Was it so beautiful that Pygmalion fell in love with his own creation? So she visited the studio of the sculptor while he was away. What she saw greatly amazed her. She couldn't help but think that the statue looked much like herself. It was so perfect. Indeed. Pygmalion had fashioned his ivory lover after the most beautiful woman alive, Aphrodite. Goddess Aphrodite was charmed by Pygmalion's creation. She brought the statue to life. Pygmalion returned home after some time, and as usual, he kissed Galatea. It was then he felt a sudden warmth in the statue's lips. He looked at her in confusion 
and it seemed Galatea was looking at him too. Pygmalion thought he was imagining things. He rubbed his eyes and looked again, and there was no mistake this time. Galatea was indeed smiling at him. His joy knew no bounds as he showered her with kisses. The ivory statue was slowly turning into flesh. Galatea had by now turned completely into a human being. She smiled at her creator and said that it was his deep love that had convinced Aphrodite to bring her to life. Soon thereafter, the two got married and invited Aphrodite as their guest of honor at the wedding. Aphrodite blessed the couple. Pygmalion never forgot to thank Aphrodite for the gift she had given him. He and Galatea brought gifts to her temple throughout their life. Aphrodite blessed the couple, and soon they had a son named Paphos, for whom the city of Paphos in Cyprus received its name. I hope that everyone grasped the storyline, but to be able to have a different knowledge about Pygmalion and Galatea, we will go through first the context by digging up Pygmalion's root, the characters, setting, the hero's journey, symbolism, and lastly, the themes. In Greek mythology, Pygmalion was a king of the island of Cyprus and a sculptor who may have been a human son of the sea god Poseidon. He spent many years carving an ivory statue of a woman. It is more beautiful than any living female. And according to myth, Pygmalion became fascinated by his sculpture and fell in love with it. He pretended it was an actual woman, that he even brought it gifts and treated it as if it were alive. However, the statue could not respond to his attentions. As you can see, it is a statue and Pygmalion became miserable because of it. Finally, he prayed to Aphrodite, the goddess of love, to bring him a woman like his statue. But Aphrodite did even better because she brought the statue to life. And Pygmalion married this woman, often called Galatea, who gave birth to a daughter. But in some versions of the story, she gave birth to a son. But don't be confused because there's a lot of circumstances that has a different versions of the story when it comes to mythology. And that is normal. So just like the context of this story, believe it or not, Pygmalion was not the first person to create a living statue in Greek mythology because according to legend, Daedalus, the genius artisan who also invented wings made from wax, mastered this featuring Greek authors which have credited Daedalus with creating sculptures that could walk, dance, and feel human sensations. And also Hephaestus was also fond of making moving figures, the very disturbing god of lax meeting and technology. So in Homer's Iliad, we learn that Hephaestus forged a pair of golden ladies to guard his house. Yep, statues of a golden lady make a great guard for security. So Hephaestus also crafted 20 golden tripods that will like little R2D2 around Olympus. So assisting with feast and household chores. Not exactly humanoid but very helpful. Moving on, in digging up Pygmalion's root, we will answer the WH question, what and who, for what? The myth on Pygmalion is probably the most well-known of the statues coming to life stories, regardless of its predecessors. In fact, a lot of Greek writers don't even discuss Pygmalion, like Clement, that gets a brief mention in the ancient anthology Bibliotica as the father of Metharme and is quoted as the king of Cyprus, in Clement of Alexandria's exhortation to the Greeks. Yet Ovid, here is a Roman poet, he wrote about Pygmalion going into great detail about the gifts that Pygmalion gave the statue and which parts of her body he liked best. Unlike Clement, 
Ovid doesn't suggest that Pygmalion was a king of Cyprus or that the statue looked like Aphrodite's mother. Alternatively, he just claims Pygmalion was an artful sculptor and the goddess gave her wish because she felt like it. So as you can see, there are always a variety of claims about how the story unfolds and each with its own set of details. So let's now learn more information about the characters. Of course, Pygmalion, a famous sculptor known for his ability to create life like statues throughout Cyprus and it's too life some at times. Many authors claim he's the king of Cyprus too but that only appears in a few accounts like Clement, Clement account so has a very strict code of moral. This can be seen in the scenario when he sees Cypriot women prostituting themselves. He swears away ladies forever and he says that he will never get married. Further, there are two ways to look at Pygmalion as a giant by God with a massive God complex because Pygmalion described to be a giant by God because of his strong opposition to women, especially to Cypriot women. Next is being a so powerful creator which connotes a dangerous message about how men can control and shape women because Pygmalion creation was a perfect idea of a woman. And lastly, on the other hand, is just a cute, emotional artist who can cope with the real world. We have to understand that feeling revolted to women was the last resort of Pygmalion to cope with the ugliness of the world. And he is absolutely repulsed when he sees the prostitutes. So please know that the circumstances were a bit different back in ancient Greece. Although the Greeks worshipped strong, independent goddesses like Athena, they generally agreed that in their daily lives, women should obey men. Daughters are to listen to their fathers, wives are to bow to their husbands, and men are to make rules. So from a modern perspective like us, we will be analyzing Pygmalion because, you know, we're living in the 21st century but it's worth nothing that our analysis takes into account many years of women's progress. So what do you think? Is Pygmalion a serious sexist or a sensitive artist? Or maybe both? I leave that question to you class. So moving on to our next character, Galatia, the statue. She has a face that's stunning. Her skin was smooth and she had a virginal quality about her. With the description of Galatia as a statue, it was kind of problematic to us as modern readers for many reasons because first they establish unrealistic beauty ideals second being a good woman leads them to being passive quiet and sex free and thirdly they imply that being white is a big part of being beautiful with their focus on her ivory skin right that up until now it became norms or standard of a beauty which should not be in the first place Next is she is being transformed by Aphrodite as a real woman. So honestly, there really wasn't that much difference between the statue and the real life lady. The greatest difference we get is that she will actually speak to the children and give birth. And for the last character, Aphrodite, we all know that she is responsible for turning a statue into a woman and she is a perceptive lady. Perceptive lady because it's simply she knows that the sculptor secretly wants his statue to come to life and so she grants his wish. Aphrodite was known to be kind of petulant and cold hearted despite being the goddess of love and Aphrodite's favor you, you have had to give her something in exchange. Usually to get Aphrodite's favor, you had to give her something. And in fact, some versions of this myth say that Aphrodite visited the studio of Pygmalion to look at the statue and she was flattered that she resembled his idea of perfect beauty. So alright, let's now talk about the setting of the story. The story takes place in the Amanthus, a royal city on the island of Cyprus. Cyprus has a lovely subtropical climate and happens to be Aphrodite's birthplace. That explains the whole thing about the festival in her honor. All that aside, most of the scenes took place inside Pygmalion's art studio while he carves his statue and falls in love. Moving on to the hero's journey or simply Pygmalion's journey. This is a framework that was developed by scholar Joseph Campbell. It is a tool that we can use to organize a myth or a story for storytellers or story readers to comprehend the tale. 
The story of Pink Million doesn't fit perfectly into the hero's journey structure, but let's give it a shot. So the first thing is the ordinary world. Pink Million lives on the island of Cyprus, so the weather is fine, his town is peaceful, and he's making pretty good artist money. And next is Call to Adventure. One day, Pink Million goes out in the glorious Mediterranean sun for a stroll, only to discover prostitutes on the street. The guy is absolutely offended, it was by the mere sight of these girls. Next, refusal of the call. Nope, Pink Million not only refuses to hang out with the girls, he swears away all women forever. It is very clear from Obi that Pink Million hates the idea of having a wife. Pink Million shuts himself up in his studio just to prove his point, just to make sense that he hates women alone. So the fourth one is meeting the mentor. The part of the journey just doesn't apply because after all Pink Million he is his own trainer, just like the Daylus. Through this myth, he is the supreme creator and the supreme creator is unable to have a teacher or guide, so he himself is his mentor. Now, crossing the threshold. It is here when things get interesting. While he may not be ready for a relationship with a real woman, Pygmalion is ready for one with a fake woman. His first step out of the natural world is to carve out of stone a beautiful woman and fall in love with her. His journey is further away from the real world with each chisel becoming fully engaged in his fantasy and followed by tests, allies, and enemies. Since a statue can't return affection physically or emotionally, there are many challenges to being in love with one. Its statue is held by Pygmalion, he's kissing her, he squeezes it out, yet she doesn't react to him amid all these advances and her hard ivory body even repels to its touches. Because it's a statue after all. The number 7, Approach of the Inmost Cave. Oh, definitely Pygmalion attempts to approach and this means that he's going too far as to lay her naked on his pillow. So metaphorically, the bed is traditionally the innermost sanctum of intercourse and romantic relations. We all know that. In taking the naked statue to it, Pygmalion reveals that given his views at the beginning of the story, he desires a lifelong intimate relationship with someone. And according to Ovid, even though he lays her on bed, Pygmalion thinks of the statue as his bride. To someone who initially abhorred the concept of marriage, this is a major step. Pink Melon also enters his psych's most cave when he goes over to the bed where he discovers the truth about his own desires. And the ordeal, stepping back into the real world that marks a break from his realm of fantasy and Pink Melon may have reservation about the wisdom of forging a lifetime commitment to a statue without life. This sentiment is confirmed when he goes to the festival of Aphrodite and prays for a bride like his statue. He is too ashamed to ask for his statue to come to life. So he knows that this is a mad thing to say out loud. So yeah, he clearly has doubts about the entire end of war. But next, number 9, reward or seizing the sword. Pink Million should not have worried though because Aphrodite felt both clear-sighted and optimistic that day. She knew that Pink Million wanted only his statue to come to life. That's why they called her Perceptive Lady. And so she gave up her wish. This may have been due to the fact that Pink Million made the statue in her mind and she was flattered by his rendering. So Pink Million has the flames that jump at the festival three times which is a positive indication that prayers are answered. So followed by the road back, hoping his wildest dreams have come true. Pink Million races back to his studio, not super excited, and the resurrection. And behold, behold, his statue has revived. She is not only revived, but Pink Million is also revived. But he never died literally, guy class, but he stopped being a happy, well-balanced guy by swearing of women and hiding in his house, and he began being a creepy weirdo living in a world of fantasies. And that's when his statue comes to life, it resurrects. Pygmalion into normalcy, he's no longer a lunatic 
a lunatic groping a statue in his own home's privacy but a guy in a loving relationship with a real woman. And last part of this journey is the return with the elixir. This is the part of the journey where the hero usually as a changed man returns to the normal world. And yes, be by marrying the living statue Galatia and having children with her, Pygmalion would completely return to the world, to the real world. He is now a happily married family man and you can really get more typical because Pygmalion was finally comfortable with the ideas of relationships and sexuality. Remember, this is the guy who was so disgusted by sex at the beginning of the myth and that he swore off half of humanity. So for him to get married and have kids with the living, breathing person is actually kind of a big deal. I hope this framework made a clear and concise understanding of the story because we will now move on to the symbolism present in the story. The first one is Pandora. This actually has a separate story because like Galatia, Pandora is crafted by a male figure out of a lab lifeless substance. So the second one is a statue of a woman which is Galatia, the main symbolic image of this story and it has two concepts to convey. First is the love advice from Asian Mint and the romantic ideals are people too. The third symbol is the reclusive artist, the man who is not really capable of coping with the environment and the people in it, usually because he is super sensible and we all know it's Pygmalion. Next is the extravagant gifts. Pygmalion gives his dead statue lots of exotic gifts in the time of honored tradition for showing someone you love them by giving them expensive stuff like jewelry, pearls, shells, earrings, rings, beautiful stones, singing birds, flowers, and even talking parrots. And lastly, the body parts. This intense focus on her body speaks on to the fact that Pygmalion's personality isn't really interested in the statue. Instead, he's centered 100% on her hat bud. This reinforces the notion that only one thing that matters about a woman is her body. A message that in contemporary culture, sadly, gets repeated a lot. So okay, for our last topic, the themes, we have four themes in total. First is manpower over woman. Pygmalion predictably carves a young, smooth, and super hot woman. She is totally silent too, so he can project all his fantasies on her. Second is art imitating life. Artists love to mix their real life and their art, and sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between what's real and what is not. In the Figmalion myth, the boundary between art and life gets very blurry because Pygmalion makes a statue so lifelike that he starts treating it like a an actual person so even as he's touching it he keeps thinking it might be real when the statue finally does come to life the division between art and life completely falls away and now she's actually a real person art is life life is art and it's all mixed up and next is the physical beauty this myth just take pleasure in describing a woman's body parts Pygmalion talks a lot about her fairness, like smooth white skin and it individually sings the phrases of her breast, lips, waist, and limbs. He even gives a shout out to her tapered fingers. What's the message? Then essentially women should be respected above all else for their beauty, which it's not real. But physical appearance was one of the main things that Asian society valued over ladies. So Ovid had no shame in eloquent waxing about the physical attributes of the statue. His description sent the message that you must be young, skinny, and have smooth ivory skin to be beautiful. Even though we know beauty can come in all shapes, sizes, and colors. So lastly, the obsession and self-denial. Pygmalion devotes himself slavishly to a female idol, worshipping her, taking in her luxurious presence, and fantasizing in some very extreme ways. Within Greek mythology, usually, things do not work out well for those who reject relationships and repress their sexual selves. And, and that is all about the story of Pygmalion and Galatia. Thank you for listening.